Let's look into a question about pre-workout supplements. Are they good or are they bullshit? This channel is all things fitness and health. That includes what supplements we should be looking at. So this is going to be the first in a supplement series I'll be doing. I really believe we get fed a ton of bullshit about supplements as far as why we should or shouldn't take a certain thing. So I'm doing what I can to filter through literature and boiling it down to the bare necessities. Now we all do need to understand that our individual needs can vary for certain supplementation and we can figure out those things from taking something like a micronutrient panel, something that I've done. It's also important to understand that things I discuss can vary person to person because our bodies are all different. This becomes apparent in many clinical studies. Supplements are developed for general use, so it's up to you to test what does and doesn't work. Full disclosure, I am not a nutritionist or a dietitian, and you should definitely consult your physician if you're worried about taking anything. However, I do have a background or a degree in biochemistry, and I'll use that knowledge to dig into any clinical studies or other published and peer-reviewed literature to help us understand what we could be putting in our body to improve performance, recovery, immunity, and just our overall health. Now enough of that, let's get into pre-workout. Let's start right off the bat and I'll just say pre-workout isn't bullshit and has been clinically proven to improve performance, focus, and recovery. But there are some factors that we definitely must understand. One, are we caffeine adapted? What ingredients should our pre-workout contain? And most importantly, what is the quality of the supplement brand we're buying? These questions kind of all intertwine because one affects the other. Like the first question is important because caffeine is a popular performance enhancing ingredient, but not if you're not caffeine adapted, which I'll get into. And even if you are caffeine adapted, the brand of supplement can really screw you up because an improper mixture and quality of the supplement brand can deliver either not enough of a dosage of the ingredient or entirely way too much. Like some supplement brands have been tested and found to have over four times the listed serving, which would absolutely destroy any performance you'd have. Like, what the hell can you do when you consume the equivalent of eight cups of coffee and eight ounces of water? The answer is absolutely nothing. So the brand we're going to see in my videos is First Form from St. Louis, Missouri, a brand that I've trusted for over 12 years and by many high performing individuals. I love what they do as far as the transparency of their product and development and have never had any issue taking anything that they produce. For that reason, I am affiliated with them and if you wanna support the channel, hit the link in the description. Anyway, let's discuss the first popular ingredient, caffeine. Ask yourself how adapted you are to caffeine. If you're someone who gets the jitters or starts to get a little squirrely after a cup of coffee, the answer is you're not. If you're someone like me who can drink a nitro cold brew and feel nothing, then you are. So this first question answers whether or not you should be looking for a stimulant or non-stimulant pre-workout. I, for one, mostly utilize a pre-workout with a stimulant, the Project One that I have here. Caffeine has been shown to improve focus, endurance, power, and improved resistance exercise at a dosage of about three to 400 milligrams on average, or more specifically, six milligrams per kilogram of body weight at most. So I should be able to consume about 550 milligrams of caffeine a day and be absolutely fine. Now, what happens when you take caffeine for a pre-workout and you either aren't caffeine adapted or take too much? Well, your heart rate increases even before you start your exercise, your body temperature rises, which then results in reaching muscle failure much sooner than you otherwise should. It's that pump you've probably felt before. If you don't know, a lot of times our body temperature is what causes our failure during a workout rather than our actual physical potential. So if you take something that already artificially increases your body temperature too much, then you're screwed. I think people find this issue more common in like HIIT style workouts or CrossFit style workouts because our heart rates just get that much higher. But if you take the proper dosage, then you can experience all the proven benefits. Again, improved focus, endurance, and power. However, cycling on and off caffeine as a pre-workout can be a good idea as tolerance has been shown to build up over 20 day periods and reduce the benefits. So I mostly do take this project one, but I'm also switching to first form stimulant free pre-workout. Actually just ordered it today. The other common ingredients we'll touch on are branch chain amino acids, citrulline malate, creatine, betaine, and beta alanine. Branch chain amino acids are one of those supplements or ingredients that just make me scratch my head. I used to take them, but studies time and time again fail to prove their efficacy. I take essential aminos separately, which in combination with branch chain amino acids have shown promising results. But this isn't a necessity and I can't understand the constant push for this as an ingredient. If you've seen other studies, please let me know. The next ingredient is our nitric oxide component, citrulline malate. Citrulline is an amino acid that's broken down by our bodies to L-arginine and then nitric oxide, which boosts oxygen delivery throughout our bodies. Now you may see some having only L-citrulline versus citrulline malate, which 
is the inclusion of malic acid. This addition of malic acid promotes the regeneration of creatine phosphate in the body, which in turn improves adenosine triphosphate or ATP production, the energy of our cells. So with understanding the biomechanism of citrulline malate, it makes sense that the studies have shown that the consumption of this ingredient has led to improved number of repetitions and the improved oxygen response improves reduction of lactic acid buildup, meaning faster recovery and reduction of that awful delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS as people call it. Next up, creatine, something a lot of people already are familiar with. Dosage recommendations are in the neighborhood of about three to five grams per day. It's another amino acid found in our muscles, but supplementation has been shown to increase intramuscular phosphocreatine levels by 30%. Not to get too far into details of creatine, I'll simply provide this verbatim from a meta-analysis from the Journal of International Society of Sports Nutrition. Creatine supplementation can help athletes tolerate heavy increases in training volume. Therefore, there is strong evidence that creatine supplementation can help athletes enhance glycogen loading, experience less inflammation and or muscle enzyme efflux following intense exercise, and tolerate high volumes of training and or overreaching to a greater degree, thereby promoting recovery. F yeah. I think people averse to creatine supplementation are worried about increased water retention, but the studies are a little back and forth, a little so-so on that. Uh, the creatine is involved in sodium-dependent creatine transport mechanism of our muscles, which due to the involvement of sodium would theoretically involve a higher uptake and retention of more water. Studies haven't really shown this to be the case. In one study, in a comparison to individuals exercising on a placebo versus creatine supplementation, both saw increases in total body water retention. This increased body water may just be the result of increased cellular volume from exercising. Muscles are just getting bigger. Next is betaine, also known as trimethylglycine, an amino acid derivative. I found a great resource that is linked in the description along with all the other studies I reviewed to create this video that really goes in depth of the mechanism of betaine, which involves the donation of the methyl group to transmethylate, yada, 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 don't wanna get into it. Just know that through this understanding, it's well understood why a study that involved six weeks of betaine supplementation showed improvements in body composition, muscle size, power, and improved work capacity. Now, lastly, it's a lot of people's favorite. It's beta alanine, our skin tingly friend. This one may be my absolute favorite and one that I may add an extra dose of depending on whether it's going to be a demanding aerobic workout. Beta alanine's job is to increase the production of carnosine in the body, which has a major role in our durance. We can't just take carnosine because it's shown that it's just not bioavailable. It gets broken up way too much before it's any use. The reason being is that carnosine acts as a pH buffer, keeping our muscles within functional range. As the pH level drops in our muscles due to things like lactic acid buildup, we hit fatigue. The use of beta alanine is a little back and forth, but just to add my two cents on this one, I subjectively feel way better when I use it. Also, I love this quote from five-time CrossFit champion Matt Frazier. What do you think beta alanine does for you? It makes me feel like I have a third lung. So recapping, we've got caffeine if you're adapted, but it's good to cycle on and off if you are, like I'm switching every other month. Citrulline malate, creatine, betaine, and beta alanine. Now, this list isn't all inclusive and just the common and highly studied ingredients that have been shown to improve performance, minus branching amino acids, I don't understand that one. I'm just, essential aminos, take that. But everyone is different and every supplement brand is going to have different ingredients and ideas of what's important. For example, I also add a pack of emergency to my pre-workout through the advisement of my primary care physician. I really haven't found any literature to validate the use of ascorbic acid for exercise, but theoretically it's involved in the repair of our body, so it can kind of make sense, breaking down muscles, whatever. I just take it because it has so many other benefits like improved immunity, so why the hell not just throw it in there? And that's it. I hope that wasn't too much information, but wanted to share my thoughts and my review of the use of pre-workout. I used to be someone that would just drink a cup of coffee, which is something common that people do, but there's a little more to it if you dig into the literature and the research. It's helped mostly with my recovery and keeping my workout intensity high every single day, just getting back into the gym. So if you like this video, let me know your thoughts by hitting that like button and subscribe or follow whatever platform you're on. Also, let me know if there are any supplements or brands you have questions on. I think this could be a valuable series. And if you wanna support the channel, get your hands on my favorite supplement brand first form, hit that link in the description or bio. See you in the next one.